again, turn on your cameras. This is how I know you are here. And I can mark you present instead of absent. Turn on your cameras if you would like to be marked as present. All right, everyone wave good morning. Happy Friday, guys. This is the last day of the week. Wave to me. I shouldn't wave to myself. Come on. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. So today's class will be rather simple. Okay. Um, we are going to start by just reviewing chapter five comprehension questions. We did five of them or roughly five. Of, uh, no, this class is a little different. Sorry, you guys chose to read on your own yesterday. I forgot about that. Okay, actually, we are going to talk about all the chapter five comprehension questions just to make sure we're good to go since I didn't get to stop and kind of answer them with you guys. Um, so we'll start by doing that. And then we are going to go back into chapter five to annotate one thing. We will also be writing down a couple of definitions today. Um, and then you'll be able to start reading chapter six on your own, okay? So before we do all of that stuff though, I do want to direct you to the lesson plan for today so I can talk to you about a couple of things, okay? So if you go into day four of this quarter, quarter two, let's see if it'll load, okay, here we go. So go to day four of the November 2nd to 6th week. This is... Over to load. Okay, so first thing first, um, when you guys are reading today, you're only going to be reading a certain number of pages. So make sure um, if you forget what I'm about to say that you look back on here, you're going to read page 85 to 91. Okay, that is all you are required to read before next class period. Okay, so very simple. I don't think it'll take you very long. If you are somebody who likes to read while listening to a voice, and since I will not be the one reading to you, and maybe you don't want to read out loud to yourself or have like your mom or dad or brother read to you, there is an audio here that you can always listen to as well, okay? Um, the audio for these pages will end at about 14, 15, so pay attention to that. Just stop it when you, you feel like stopping it, um, and here's the link to that. I also would like you to begin working on your comprehension questions while reading. Okay. The comprehension questions for chapter six are linked right here. So I would download those now if you would like, so you don't forget about that. Um, we'll start next class by using those first couple questions on this handout um, to review the chapter for what you would have read. Okay, so go ahead, download those, start working on them. A big thing, a big thing to realize is that you will be having a quiz next week on day two. Okay, it says Tuesday here. It's not Tuesday for you guys. It's going to be Wednesday. I need to change that to the slash Wednesday. Um, so be aware there's a quiz on chapters four to six on day two of next week. Okay, um, so start reviewing for that. I will remind you of this on day one of next week too. Okay, and then of course we'll tell you on day two because it'll be quiz time. Um, so that is that. So um, I'll direct you back here later before we actually start reading as well though okay so i'm now going to share with you guys your comprehension questions so we can go through them together make sure you have those pulled up on your device so you can quickly access them if i call on you to respond to a question okay all right give me one second to pull it up oh um, mrs miss Con condos yes kevin uh so when is the essay due, like the really big one? You're not going to hear about that until next week. So, um, oh, so we're going to talk. You don't have to worry about working on that or anything right now. No. Okay. Got no. It. it won't be due until, I want to say the due date I have. I can give it to you guys now if you want it. Um, but I was going to talk to you all about that next week. But um, it is going to be due right before Thanksgiving break. So, for you guys, that will be the... 20th, November 20th. We're going to spend though like a week, a week or so working on it, just working on it in class once we finish reading the book. Okay. Um, so the last couple chapters go really quickly. So after this chapter, they're all pretty short. So we're going to finish it rather quickly. Okay. Um, so you don't have to stress about that. 
Does that answer your question, Kevin? Yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, yeah, so if you guys wanna write that down, November 20th is when your official due date for your essay is going to be, okay? Um, all right, so let's talk about these questions. Um, at the very beginning of the chapter, when other people are blessing and praising the name of God, what is going through Eliza's head? And I just asked you to kind of summarize that or uh, put it into your own words. So let's hear from Janelle. Janelle, what did you write for question number one on your comprehension question? Um, I said that he was upset that God like let everything happen to the Jewish people who like um, had faith in him the most and he was doubting God's presence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was definitely doubting, questioning his power, questioning God's strength. Um, we even see him kind of say that he believes he is stronger than God. Um, so we see a lot of anger, a lot of doubt, a lot of questioning going on at the beginning of this chapter. Um, question number two, what is Eliza's act of rebellion toward God on Yom Kippur? Let's hear from Randy. Randy, what is your answer number two? You're kind of cutting out, Randy. What was that? Can you say it again? Uh, I said Eliza's act of rebellion toward God on Yom Kippur was to eat, uh, eat food instead of fast. Very good. He chose to eat instead of fast. He technically gave two reasons for this. The first was that his dad had actually told him not to fast um, because he wanted him to survive and have strength. Um, but his reason was out of rebellion. He's, he said he no longer accepted God's silence during this time. Number three, in this camp, selection is reinstated. What is the selection intended for in general? Is Eliza selected? Is his father selected? Um, let's hear from uh, Toby. Toby, go ahead and um, give us your answer for number three. Um, the selection was to separate people who could not work from the ones that could. Mm -hmm. And neither was uh, Eliza and his father were not selected. Very good. Okay, so at this point, we find out that they're both not selected. At least that's what everyone thinks, right? And then Eliza's father runs towards him to give him news. What is the news that he shares and what exactly does this mean? Um, let's hear from Camden. Camden, what is your answer to number four? Camden. Uh-oh, okay, so guys, just a refresher, if your cameras are off and you don't respond to me, that makes me think you're not actually here, so you'll be marked absent even though you turned it on before. Okay, um, let's hear then from Alicia. Alicia, what is your answer number four? Um, I said Eliza's father shared that he has been told to stay in the camp as well, which means his number was written down as well and didn't know at first. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so um, this means that he, in fact, was selected, even though initially he thought he was not selected. Um, so very good. Then at this point, Eliza's father gives him his inheritance, or at least that's what Eliza calls it. What does he give him as an inheritance? Let's hear from Jordan. Jordan, what does he give him? Uh, his father passes him a knife and a spoon. And very good. Him don't sell it. Very good. Yes. So he gives him a knife and a spoon and he says, don't sell it to keep them and maybe they can help him one day. And number six, what does Eliza find out about his father when he gets back to the camp that night? So let's hear from Jessica. Jessica, what does he find out? Um, I said he finds out that his father was not selected and he was still alive. Very good. He finds out his dad was not selected and he is still alive. At that point, he switches to talking about his experience in the infirmary. His foot was badly injured. We don't exactly know what was going on during this time, at least when question seven was answered. We don't know. We eventually do find out that his foot, like his heel was filled with pus, which sounds disgusting. Um, and the doctor had to go in and basically drain his, his foot. Um, so while he was in the infirmary, He's laying next to this man who he describes as basically dead. He only knew he was there from his voice. 
Um, he never heard him move or heard him do anything other than talk randomly. Um, so why does this man say he needs to leave the infirmary as soon as possible? Um, let's hear from Savannah. Savannah, what is your answer to number seven? I put the man lying in bed next to Eli tells him he needs to leave the infirmary because there's a selection more often in the infirmary than outside. All right, good. So there's more selections inside the infirmary than there are outside of the infirmary. Um, and if he wants any chance of survival, he needs to leave before that selection process happens. Now, it's interesting here, after he hears this, he starts thinking, Eliza starts thinking to himself, like, is this man telling me the truth? Or is he trying to get rid of me so he has a better chance of survival? And the importance of that really is just to put more emphasis on the fact that everybody in these camps is really just thinking of themselves and their own survival, okay? Um, and his questioning of this, the, the intentions or integrity of this older man um, is showing that Eliza is thinking about his own safety, right? Um, and his own survival too. Okay, so number eight, the man in the infirmary with Eliza says, I have more faith in Hitler than in anyone else. He does give a reason for this. What is his reason that he gives? Um, let's hear from John. John, what is your answer to number eight? Uh, let me check. Okay. I put, because like Hitler is the only one that like was, that kept a promise to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Hitler is keeping his promises while God in their mind is not. Um, number nine, when the camp is chosen to be evacuated, Eliza and his father decide to leave together. What does Eliza eventually learn about what would have happened if they would have just stayed? Let's hear from Pranati. Pranati, what is your answer to number seven? Or number nine, not number seven, sorry. Uh, uh, so I said if they stayed, they would have been killed. They said they, 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 they would have been killed? I think so, yeah. Okay, so he actually tells us that, and I can't remember what page it's on. I think it's like 82, roughly. I don't have my book in front of me. Um, but he actually says they would have been liberated by the Russians. So he found out that literally two days later, they were liberated by the Russians. They were never killed. The people in the infirmary were not killed. Okay, so make sure you adjust your answer if you had something different there. And that leads to number 10. So they're being... Um, evacuated because the Red Army is coming to shut down this camp. And um, the Blockle test ends up telling the men to clean the block before leaving. And um, why do they have to clean the block? What is the reason that they give? Um, let's hear from Joshua. Joshua, what do they tell um, is the reason for cleaning the block? Um, I put before evacuating, the men have to clean the block because they had forgot to. They wanted to do this for the liberating army. They wanted to let the liberators know that they are men, not dirty pigs. Okay, so the block will test tells them that we need to clean this block in order to let the liberating army know that men were living here and not pigs, okay? So this kind of shocked Eliza that he would have had him do this. He goes, oh, so we are men after all. We're not pigs like you've been treating us uh, for this entire time that we've been here. Um, so he's very shocked by this statement. And that happened on page 84. That was the very last page of the chapter um, before they leave Buna, okay, for their death march, which is technically phase four of the Holocaust. So the final phase of the Holocaust. Now, that is going to lead us into some of the definitions that we're going to be writing down today. The definitions are dealing with the literary term of irony. So I'm going to share a slide with you right now, and I want you to write this stuff down on the top of page 85. So turn to page 85 in your book, and you're writing it here simply because you can't fit it at the end of chapter five. So I'm just going to be writing it at the start since it's going to be right next to the page you're going to be annotating. Um, so on the very top of page 85, which is the start of chapter six, you are going to write down four words and their definitions, okay? Those four words are listed for you on the left-hand side of this slide that I'm showing you right now. You're going to write down irony, 
And the definition is a contrast between appearance and reality. And then you can write down that there are three types. And then the other three words in their definitions are listed on bullet points right below irony, okay? You're gonna write down what verbal irony is, what situational irony is, and what dramatic irony is. I'm gonna give you about two and a half minutes to write down these words and their definitions before I actually read the definitions and give you examples, okay? Um, so I will start my timer for two and a half minutes right now. Again, you're writing this on page 85. In this comment, is it yeah. fine if we just type it or do we have to write it? In if you want to type it, that's totally fine. Um, that's totally fine. Just make sure you have these definitions available to you is basically what I want you to, to do. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna start going over these terms and giving you a few examples to kind of make it a little bit more clear about what these could look like or sound like. Um, so verbal irony is going to be the kind of irony that you guys would hear a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. The another word for verbal irony is sarcasm, okay? So this is gonna be when somebody says something but they actually mean something else, okay? Um, this, uh, the only way to really identify this um, in a book is going to be, you have to really know characters. You need to know um, what their mindsets are like. You need to know the context in which they're actually saying this stuff. Because if you don't know that, you wouldn't be able to identify if they're being sarcastic in that moment, okay? So it really does take a deep understanding of a character and how they interact with people, what their thought process is in order to identify this. Um, an example, if in real life, if some, if there was a hurricane going on and somebody says, wow, it's really nice weather today, that would be sarcasm making it verbal irony, okay? So even though they're saying it's nice weather, we know they mean something else by that. Um, the next type is situational, which is when something happens that is not exactly expected or is contrary to what somebody might think would be going on in that moment. So an example of that would be a fire station burning down. We would expect a fire station could not burn down because the people who fight the fires and all the resources for fighting fires are at that fire station. But if it burns down, that would make it situational irony. Um, dramatic irony is gonna be the one you guys would see most common in movies, TV shows, uh, plays, um, fictional stories as well, which is when an audience or reader knows something that a character in the story does not know, 
okay? So for example, horror films are notorious for doing dramatic irony. Um, when you guys know as the audience of this movie that the serial killer is hiding in that abandoned shed in the backyard, and then the person who's running from the serial killer thinks, oh, that abandoned shed looks perfect. I'm gonna go in there and then they die. Okay, that's dramatic irony. Well, we know where the serial killer is, but the person running away from them does not and they run right to them. Um, a literary example of this, you guys all were supposed to have read Romeo and Juliet during your freshman year. I don't know if you did or did not, uh, but you were supposed to have. Um, and in, at the very end of the play, spoiler alert coming on, um, Juliet does not actually die. Um, she takes a sleeping potion, but when Romeo finds her, he thinks she's dead. And he then proceeds to kill himself and actually kill himself. And then Juliet wakes up and sees that he's actually dead. And then she kills herself. So because of Romeo not actually knowing that she took a sleeping potion, um, it creates dramatic irony for us. So we go, oh, that's ironic that now he actually killed himself and now they can't actually be together. So those are some examples. For the purpose of um, your quiz coming up next week, all you need to know for this information is the definitions. That is all you will be quizzed on, okay? You will not be asked to identify examples or label things or analyze things based off of the definitions. All you need to know is the definitions, okay? So be aware of that. Now, we are gonna practice this a little bit. On page 84, it gives the command from the Blockle test that they are to clean up the block, okay, or to mop the floors. So I want you to underline that command from the Blockle test on page 84. Go ahead and do that right now. Underline that. And I want you to label it as one of these types of irony. Is it verbal irony? Is it situational irony? Or is it dramatic irony, okay? So go ahead and take like 30 seconds to think which one of these definitions does that command fit? And I'm gonna call on someone, so be prepared. All right, who thinks they know what type of irony this could be? Give me a thumbs up if you think you know. All right, I got a lot of people with their cameras off. I'm gonna ask you to turn your cameras on so I know you're actually in front of me. You shouldn't need your camera off to make an annotation. All right, thumbs up if you think you know what type of irony this is, the command of cleaning the blocks before they leave. All right, a few of you guys. Let's hear from Armand. Armand, what type do you think it is? I think it's situational. It is situational, very good. If you guys marked it as situational, give yourself a nice little pat on the back. Armand, why is it situational? Oh, well, because like you wouldn't expect them to like tell them to clean it up since they're usually living in like a really dirty place. Exactly. So one of the reasons why it's unexpected is because they've been living like this all along and now you want us to clean it up. You didn't ask us to clean it before, right? You didn't care that it was dirty before. So that's one reason. Another reason is that they're supposed to be rushing out of this place. Now we have to stop and clean. Are you kidding me? You want us to avoid this army and now you want me to clean? So it's taking more time, which makes us think, why would they want them to do that? I would have expected them just to rush away. Okay, so two reasons as to why it would be unexpected making it situational, okay? So very, very good. If you marked it a situational, great job. If you didn't, don't stress out. We are gonna have tons of practice with this moving forward, okay? It was just one time of trying to see can we match a definition to an example, okay? So very, very good. I am going to share once again with you guys the lesson plan because now it is your time to read, okay? You need to read from page 85 to 91. I am going to ask that you guys all show me your books right now so I know that you have your book and you're ready to go with that. 
Hold up your book and your camera. All right, wonderful. Great job, guys. Okay, so while reading today, I'm gonna ask that you start working on your comprehension questions for chapter six, okay? Also make note if you see anything that's dehumanizing, if you see Eliza or his father losing any sense of hope, um, whether that be to live or to stay together or hope in each other maybe, um, make note of that. And of course, remember our essay coming up is going to be about Eliza and his faith, either strengthening or weakening. So annotate any moment you see it either strengthening or weakening, okay? so. That is your task for today. Um, I am going to ask that you guys stay on Zoom while you're doing this. So you're gonna have, um, you guys are out of here at the 45. So you guys have a good amount of time to read. I will let you guys go five minutes early though, okay? So at the 40, um, I will say if you wanna leave Zoom, you're more than welcome to at that point, okay? So that is your task. Go ahead and start reading. Let me know if you have questions, okay?